Well, finally, Saul has realized that David does not want to harm him. But he also realizes that David is going to become the king. And the lesson that we learned in chapter 24 was that sometimes we have to trust God, even with our enemies. Chapter 25, Samuel the prophet dies in Ramah. And David goes to Paran. And along the way, we learn about a man in Maon, a wealthy man named Nabal. Nabal has 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He's very wealthy. And he sends his shearers out Carmel, but to Carmel. And you'll see on the map here, the yellow section just to the left of the Dead Sea. You'll see Carmel and you'll also see uh, that uh, David is going to be going down uh, to uh, Maon. But in any case, we find uh, Nabal having his shearers up in Carmel. And uh, there we learn that uh, he has a wife named Abigail, who's intelligent, who's beautiful. And we find that Nabal has a character of being harsh and evil and a Calebite. David sends his men gently and politely and he says we've been watching over your shearers we haven't hurt them at all we've not interfered with them at all but a festival is coming up and would you please give us uh, some uh, rations some food whatever you might have Nabal who is uh, very rude and uh, very uh, anti uh, sharing with anyone says, why should I give anything to this unknown man? Uh, he may be just a servant that broke away from his master. When the men come back to David and tell him the, res the kind of response that Nabal made, uh, he forms a little army of 400 men, leaving 200 in their base, and starts out to find revenge against Nabal. In the meantime, in verses 14 through 17 of chapter 24, we find that one of the shearers uh, tells Abigail all that's gone on, how David's men have not only not bothered them, but they've even protected them from others. And that Nabal has been rude and had, has uh, caused problem between David and himself and now David is uh, on his way to take revenge against Nabal and his whole family. It's interesting to note that the servant even says, our worthless master, and that nobody can reason with him. It tells us a lot about Nabal's character, doesn't it? Well, in any case, Abigail quickly takes provisions, uh, puts them on the mule, uh, and starts to move towards where David is supposed to be. Uh, and uh, David is out to get all of Nabal's family, but Abigail intercedes and re meets him on the road. She humbly begs him for forgiveness, offers the food, explains that she has a worthless husband, and uh, David is uh, impressed with Abigail and her humbleness, her discernment, and her desire to keep peace. And uh, he, he asked God to bless her and uh, that, that it has saved lives. And uh, David didn't want to take lives unnecessarily. Verses 36 uh, and following, Nabal uh, is back at his own place and he is partying and he's drunk and uh, Abigail comes home, sees that he's been partying and that he's drunk, and she leaves him alone. In the morning, when he's sober, she tells him all that's gone on, how she interceded, how she provided the first supplies for David, and uh, how she kept them from having uh, annihilation, but he does not repent. Nabal is stubborn as well as everything else. 
But it tells us in the scripture here in verses 36 and following for, to 38, that just 10 days after this conf confrontation with Abigail, that uh, we find that Nabal dies. David heard about this and uh, he sent a proposal to Abigail to become his wife. This would be his uh, second wife that is still his. Uh, he has Ahanam uh, and now he'll have Abigail because Saul has taken uh, his previous wife and given her away to another man. So what do we learn from all of this? Well, first we ought to learn that reputation is important. Look at the reputation that David had. Look at the reputation that Abigail had. Look at the reputation that Nabal had. Reputation is important. And that comes from our actions. Secondly, I think it's important for us to see that investigation prior to action is always prudent. Nabal should have investigated whether or not his shearers were really, really were protected by David. And Abigail was smart enough to have investigated and to listen to her shearers. David probably would have been wise uh, to do a little more investigation before just taking all of Nabal's family and killing them. Thirdly, we ought to be peacemakers. Abigail wanted to avoid blood loss. She wanted to avoid there being a war. And we all ought to be peacemakers wherever we can, as much as in our power. We ought to try to reconcile all situations that we can. Fourthly, I think it's very important to remember, and I certainly had to deal with this as a pastor, you cannot reason with a drunk person. Abigail showed great wisdom in not trying to deal with her husband while he was drunk. She waited till morning to deal with him when he was sober. But sometimes you can't even reason with someone who is stubborn and evil. And uh, that's exactly what happened here. Abigail could not reason with Nabal. David now has two wives. He has a following of about 600 men. And we find that he has gotten the provisions that he wanted for the festival. We find that he has taken a beautiful wife that's intelligent and will be an asset to him. And that's my thought for the day. God bless you and have a great day. Well, how can you be sure you're going to heaven? My son said I should never end a message without telling people how they can be sure they're going to heaven. You can find it easily in just a few verses in the book of Romans. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin is anything that's displeasing to God. We all sin every day. By unclean thoughts, a quick answer to someone that's inappropriate, uh, whatever it might be, we all sin and we all fall short of the glory of God. And we know that the wages of sin are death. Romans 6.23 tells us that clearly. The wages of sin are death. We're all guilty of sin and we all deserve death. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, God demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's it. That's, that's exactly how God showed his love. He allowed us to see that Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, died for us and rose again to prove that he had the power over death. Now watch this. How do we obtain this? It's one thing to know it. You can have it here in your head, but not down in your heart. You know, here's how we obtain it. If we confess and believe in our heart, God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And it says believing it's considered righteousness, not our own righteousness, but Christ's righteousness. With our mouth we confess. And it says, and, and when we confess, it results in salvation. In verse 13, it goes on and says, whoever will call upon the Lord shall be saved. So if you've confessed your sin and said, yes, Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, I know that you died for my sins. I'm going to turn from sin and self and to you and to you alone. Then you can know for certain if you really meant it, really meant it, 
then you know that you have eternal life in heaven. I hope that you've prayed a prayer similar to that, that you've acknowledged Christ as your Savior, that you've invited him into your life to be your Lord and your Master, that you've turned from sin and self and received him to be the Lord of your life. And that's my prayer for you. Remember, at the end of this clip, there's an opportunity for you to see the last lesson that we had and also a clip that says how you can have peace in a broken world with the three circle illustration. It's a wonderful witnessing tool to share with others if they don't know Christ as Savior and to see how God fixed a broken world. God bless you and have a great day.